Hello and welcome back to the Frontline Security Podcast. Join me, Carl Randall, as I'll be talking to some of the key influencers within the security industry. Now with me today is Simon Rogers, who is the owner and founder of Turret Training. Turret Training specializes in pre-hospital trauma care courses. And today we're gonna be talking all about those courses, how important first aid is, especially for security professionals, and we're gonna be touching on Martin's Law. Let's get into it, shall we? Who tried that first? I I don't know. Don't ask me how the scientists came across that. I have no idea. Just keep it simple. Simple things do well save lives. Some people, you can't save them all, you know, but you can at least give them a fighting chance. So, Simon, first of all, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've been talking about getting this done for a while, so here we are. So, first of all, before we get into turret training, what made you start it, tell me about how you got to where you are now. Oh, geez, that's a long story, but um, 30 years in the police service, uh, UK police service, um, I did a number of roles within that uh, time and uh, retired in 2019, um, took a year out um, and then uh, decided to do something about what I was doing, which wasn't very much. So I formed uh, Turret Training Limited uh, with a view to passing on some of my hard-earned experience and knowledge around um, pre trauma into the commercial sector. So that's where I formed uh, Turret Training, just at time when COVID hit. <clears throat> so that was a big struggle. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it, it, was, it was quite a good test for the business. So um, obviously when we started off, um, it got hammered, so um, we got pushed back. So really didn't really start getting going until about 2021, really. Uh, so the rest is history now. So you mentioned that you were in the police for was it over 30 years. Yep. So was it experiences in the police that then led you to be like, I want to educate other people in how to deal with these situations? Uh, yeah, um, uh, there was a lot of experiences, um, uh, predominantly around uh, first aid interventions and looking after people, um, which obviously then led to interactions with other agencies like the security sector. Um, so um, I basically looked at that um, as a cross-decking sort of skill. So before we get into the pre-hospital trauma care course, yeah. when you are in the police, I'm interested to know how much first aid training you actually get. At what level is it? Is it close to what you're teaching now? In the- um, it is now. Um, back in the day, I mean, I joined in 1989. Um, so um, it was a long time ago. It was a little bit like life on Mars. Um, so... There was generic first aid at work, uh, and it was predominantly a three-day course. Um, but uh, over the time, over those years, you just got used to, and the experiences and the exposure you had just fine-tuned your knowledge and experience about managing general first aid. Um, it changed slightly when I got into the firearms world, and it became a little bit more um, it, um, involved, um, and there was a lot more to do with regards to uh, pre hospital trauma. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what inspired you to... Yeah, basically. I mean, I held a, a number of portfolios within the police uh, firearms unit uh, as a national firearms instructor. And as a consequence, you had certain responsibilities and certain skill sets, um, which you were sent on courses for. Uh, one of which was uh, a regional portfolio lead for um, trauma training. Um, so that's how I started to develop that knowledge. Nice. And I suppose first aid in general, let's start with first aid in general. Obviously, it's an incredibly important yep. incredibly important topic for I mean they should be teaching in schools yeah um, I know we've got a first aid video which has got over 2 million views and we're constantly getting oh, people God. saying it's fantastic everyone should learn it okay uh, but the SIA introduced first aid training as a mandatory requirement for door supervisors in 2021 I think it was yeah how important is it that security professionals do have first aid training um well, it's, it's really important, even even more so nowadays, because, of, as we know, the um, Terrorism Protection Bill, which was formerly known as Martin's Law, is now going through legislation. But, how, but previous to that, um, let's take, for instance, door supervisors. If they were managing um, venues many years ago, um, they would be first on scene before ambulances or even police to manage people who perhaps had had a fall because they were a little bit inebriated. So that sort of skill set was always important for the security world. Um, and now the onus is much more on the security sector with more responsibility. So therefore, that first aid is really starting to come to the fore now. Uh, you know, we're looking at um, 
shopping malls and precincts and airports, these places where there are huge places with big populations of people turning up. So um, they're having more medical emergencies, therefore they're using their skills more often and more optimal. So it's a good thing to have. Yeah, I mean, I suppose in the course as well, obviously they're trained to deal with CPR, hmm. choking, those kind of things, but they're also taught how to um, communicate properly with the emergency services. Yep. As well, so like shopping malls, if someone's having a stroke, yeah, then then know how to communicate. Um, I think that's one of the big things that they are trying to drill. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there's, there's, there are acronyms around that have been around for quite a while. Uh, one of them is methane, which is just a formulaized, formulaized way in which you explain information in a, in a critical incident or major incident. Um, but when it comes to first aid, yeah, talking to the patient or the casualty is really important and having that presence of mind to do that. Um, and it actually doesn't have to be anything particularly as an intervention. If you have someone, for instance, having an asthma attack, um, it's a, a good bedside manner, you know, keeping them calm um, and just looking after them. So that sort of reduces their sort of um, uh, stress levels and actually allows them to manage their their, their asthmatic sort of event more, more readily. Um, so something as simplistic as that, and then you more than scale that up to CPR, which is quite invasive uh, and quite intense, um, and those are the generic sort of skill sets. Uh, and then you're moving into your three-day courses, which look at um, more generic first aids, like diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Brilliant. So, I mean, moving on, you've developed the pre-hospital trauma care course, which goes well, quite a few steps beyond the basic first aid training. Yeah. You told me a little bit about the pre-hospital trauma care course, how it came about, what is it? Um, so the... Program that I was uh, trained in is known as D13. D13 was a fixed uh, a module within the National Police Farms Training Curriculum, um, and it was designed, written, and developed by um, some fantastic people uh, from the Faculty of Prehospital Care, Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, um, and um, they put this together through the college to assist and develop um, police firearms officers um, in managing seriously injured. Um, people or police officers uh, that have been either shot or injured in some way or form within what is known as a, uh, a non-permissive uh, environment. So back in the day, there was a time where it would only be the police firearms units in these areas. And if there were people who were injured, um, it would be um, right and proper to actually carry out some form of intervention to safeguard them and save their life. So this training uh, was developed to assist the authorised farms office to deliver life-saving skills in, a, in that sort of environment. Nice. And what, what does the course actually cover? Uh, so it does cover, cover generic first aid, but it's more predicated towards um, trauma-based incidents. Um, and some of it is multiple casualty um, sort of events. Um, but you're looking at um, uh, the scene safety management and how you secure that. Uh, you're looking at uh, managing catastrophic bleeds um, where people are bleeding out quite profusely and understanding what is a time-critical bleed and what isn't. And you're moving on a, in a systematic way and you're talking about airway management um, and then breathing circulation and you're going into disability in the environment. And the reason it follows that stepwise approach, which is slightly different to the first aid app work process, is that it's the way, in, unfortunately, in which people um, die very quickly. So it's that stepwise approach. If they're bleeding out, they're more likely to die from that than they are from an airway. And if you've secured the airway, then they're more likely to, to, to die from a, um, a a breathing problem as you go through the stepwise approach. Sorry, I just hit them. <laughs> it's but, all right. Um, yeah, so it's a stepwise approach. So it looks to secure uh, a casualty or casualties very quickly um, and then move on. Yeah, because it's a, it's a four-day course, isn't it? Um, yeah, it can be either a three- or a four-day course. Um, you can actually push it into a five-day course if you want. And you can bring in um, analgesia, a thing called methoxiflurane. Um, there's a trade name called Penthrox. It's been around f uh, since the early 70s, um, particularly in the Australasian areas. Um, uh, they use it to great effect on Bondi Beach in Australia. Mm -hmm. So if you stick in on a Google search engine, Green Whistle, you'll see it in action. Um, but they brought it into the UK, particularly within the firearms worlds, um, I think around 90, uh, sorry, 2014-15, um, and they've been having some trials and it started to come in. So um, it can be a three, four or five day course. Yeah. I, I came to visit you about, was it about a month ago? Yes. Um, for one of the days on the course. Yeah. 
Um, and I have to say, you were fantastic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, you were absolutely fantastic. There was about eight or nine people on the course, yep. and you could see they were all just listening to every word you were saying. Um, yeah, your teaching style was fantastic. But what Thank you were you. actually teaching as well, I mean, I was only there for maybe half a day, just over yep. half a day, and yep. I was learning so much. Um, great. Yeah. And just the, the way you were doing it, the examples you were going through, it's quite hard to obviously simulate big accidents yeah. um, without some actually hurting someone. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but even we're not like, into that now. No, no. But even stuff like packing the wounds, showing yeah. people how to pack wounds properly. Yeah. Um, really, really good stuff. Yeah, it's, it's all about the technique as much as it is about um, uh, uh, preparing that security officer to, to actually manage those types of in, in injuries. Because uh, it's one thing saying this is a piece of kit. It's another thing actually using it. Uh, so the idea behind the, the training is is to um, immerse them in a in a stressful environment. So you inoculate them in terms of uh, their uh, capability. So you enhance their performance, and actually they switch off to what's actually really quite traumatic, perhaps to the patient and maybe to the, the security medic, and actually uh, give good care uh, in those environments. So it's important to be able to replicate that as best you can without hurting them, of course. So obviously with the course as well, there's obviously the practical elements showing people how to pack the wounds like we talked yeah. about and other elements which we'll touch on in a second. Um, but there's also quite a lot of theory of the course as well. Um, and in here you have lots of practical examples, yeah. um, well, real world examples of where these things have actually saved lives. Yeah. Uh, would you mind sharing a few of those? Well, yes, I suppose so. So um, one uh, example is a, let's say, a, a casualty was involved in a, um, a car accident um, involving a tipper truck. Um, so uh, this casualty was trapped um, and the uh, uh, two legs, so uh, this person had um, 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 uh, broken femurs, uh, both, both legs, uh, and they were compound fractures, so they were, they were, they were breaking out through the skin. Um, one, when we turned up, we were the first vehicle on the scene. Um, it was very evident that this person was, was bleeding out quite profusely. So um, the application of the tourniquet went on um, pretty smart. Um, 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 and the application of that sort of stemmed the flow of blood. Um, um, and it gave that casualty a fighting chance, if, if you like, um, to um, be extricated from the vehicle and, and taken to hospital. So um, that is an example of, a, uh, I suppose, a very basic skill, but to be practised and trained well uh, and done under those sort of circumstances. So it's one thing actually teaching a, a person to apply a tourniquet in, in a classroom environment. It's another actually taking it from a what is known as supine position lying on the floor, which is generic CPR, to sticking them upside down in a vehicle. Uh, you know, it's, it's more practically based uh, and it's scenario-specific um, around what and how these types of injuries occur. So, yeah, so some of, some of my experiences, were, well, there's a lot of experiences. Uh, I've dealt with an awful lot of trauma uh, and road death uh, and um, criminality, etc. over the 30 years. So obviously seeing these things are very traumatic. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who's obviously been trained in the face of a a problem like this, they're facing this traumatic incident in front of them because it must be quite scary thinking, God. Um, <clears throat> I, I suppose if, you, if you're going to do this type of training, you want to do that type of training. So you want to be um, motivated to help these sort of people in these types of situations. So I think that helps with their mindset, manage that sort of uh, process. Uh, but, you know, these things stack after a while mentally um, so it's probably reverting to your training. If you've got good training um, that reflects or replicates that type of environment, uh, that helps you step through it uh, and applying that, those techniques. Um, and then equally, once the aftermath, what, the aftermath of that sort of uh, incident, it's about talking to your peers, um, talking to your friends, uh, family, and if needs be, uh, um, self-reflecting and see whether you need any support or help. Uh, and it's now come to the fore even more nowadays with, with mental health first aid. And I think that's a really good thing. You know, back in the day, um, it didn't really exist. Uh, you just, um, you know, just get on with it, uh, suck yeah. it up and move on. Um, and, and there's an element to that. 
Um, you've got to be robust to be able to manage those sort of situations. But ultimately, um, it can stack and it take, take its toll. So being open, having a chat with someone in fight, confiding with them, and perhaps if there's people there who have been involved in that or experienced that, just to, uh, having a chat with them. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's really good advice. And I know we were talking before we off camera, before we started this, about mental blueprinting. Um, could yeah. you give us an overview of what that is? Um Okay, so um, it's about performance management, really, I suppose. And um, I sort of got exposed to that many years ago through um, my mentor, Tony Blower from um, America. So he's a TCMS, he's a world leader in um, uh, martial arts training and, and conflict management stuff. Um, but basically, he, he advocates uh, um, fear loop and uh, mental blueprinting as a really good performance enhancement sort of tool. So what it basically looks like is visualising... Uh, the uh, injury and how you would go to apply that um, in uh, in terms of dealing with it. Um, so it just prepares you mentally to to um, manage that more effectively. Uh, and I, I think probably the best way to to give an example, if you look at the Winter Olympics, for instance, uh, the bobsleigh teams. Uh, if you've got the four man bobsleigh um, and you've got the driver, they s- stand at the st- the top of the slope and there's a pause and a period where they're waiting if you look at the driver with his helmet he's moving his head and he's going left and right and bobbing around so what he's doing is he's running that route in his head so the idea is to think about you know what it would be like to engage with an adversary for instance who's got an edge weapon Uh, or uh, a person who's trapped in a vehicle um, or multiple casualties. And then it's about going through that process uh, mentally to to experience that and then applying that into a replicative scenario. Um, So you immerse them in that sort of experience and you probably going to fail first time because, you know, that's what happens. And then the next time you go again, you get better at it. So actually you uh, enhance your capability in a very stressful environment. So that's what blueprinting is around. It's about um, visualising these types of incidents, um, having a generic template, and then going from there. It's almost a bit like Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? Yeah. yeah kind of, you know the movie? Uh, I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great analogy. That went off the wall, but uh, sure. yeah, yeah, but absolutely. you're giving the example. Yes, it's like yeah. the Sherlock and he Holmes. exactly does do that because if you see that, he goes right. I'm going to hit him on the head. He's yeah. going to suffer that ear ear bland uh, ear deafening thing, and it's exactly that. Yeah, um, you know, um, we, we talk about um, threshold drills. So on the fire and tactical firearms units, we 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 uh, rock up on a on a on a threshold, and so we're talking about um, door entries. Um, we talk about it, then we think about it, uh, and then we talk about it, and then we go and do it, and then we re- redo it and redo it and do it. Um, so as we do it, we get, make it more challenging. So um, f- as an example, using that type of blueprinting, um, I was down at Battersea um, a Power Station doing some training with the guys. I took them out of the classroom because it was a waste of time. Um, sticking them on a, a dummy on a floor on a carpet in a warm environment, sod that, get them out. So it was cold, freezing, um, it was down by the um, uh, loading bay, and they've got a train th- track that thunders across. CPR, can you hear a defib? Hell, can you? So what it does is it fine-tunes their experience and think, right, I need to do something about this. So now I've experienced that. How do I overcome that? So blueprinting is about thinking, well, if I'm in a really crowded area and there's lots of people and it's noisy, or, I'm in a, or this person's collapsed down by a train track, uh, at Battersea, how can I best enhance my performance by listening to that DFIP? Well, if you just did that in a classroom, you'll never know. So it's about going out, experiencing the drills and just keeping at it uh, and thinking about how that looks in your head. Yeah. I've gone on a bit, but... That's fine. I mean, it's always different in the classroom to a real world experience. Yeah, it is it? hugely, yeah. And going back to the course, um, a lot of the course reflects around the fast aid kit. Yeah, Um Absolutely. I mean, I'm a massive advocate of that. If you if you're going to pass, a, you're going to get someone some training, give them the kit to deliver that training. Otherwise, it's it's a waste of time. Um, and then if you give them a a, a a med kit, 
It's as, as useless as a chocolate fire guard if you don't teach them how to use it. Uh, and equally, it's the provenance of integrity around that, that med kit as well. Uh, so um, our fast aid kit uh, that, that was designed over a period of time, uh, uh, it, it, it's designed to follow the course structure. So it's a dual role single solution capability. It looks at multiple casualties um, and it will manage uh, generic first aid emergencies from your first aid at work up to including uh, polytraumatically injured casualty or casualties. Um, and it's, again, the way it works is that it's, it's a very quick access kit and it's set out in a stepwise approach which um, reflects the stepwise approach of the course. Uh, and so you have access to, for instance, the bleed control systems very quickly because the less time you have trying to search for it, even in low light conditions, the, the more time you can spend on safeguarding the casualty. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the good things on the course as well. You were constantly drilling in to be like, this is your kit, look after it. Yeah. Look yeah, after it. Absolutely. Make sure everything's yeah. where it should be. Yeah, because come the day of reckoning, it might be you that gets injured. Uh, and you want to make sure that whoever's giving you that fast aid um, knows how it's set out and it's ready ready, ready to go. Um, one of the things that some people do is, is think about threading through a tourniquet, uh, through a belt buckle. Um, and we don't do that. Uh, simply because you never know how the patient's going to present. And um, certainly from our experience um, and mine, if you've got casualties trapped or debris covered in, you can't thread a tourniquet in a loop over, over a leg through a footwell of a car onto a seat. It's just, it's just nigh impossible. Uh, so you have to have that facility where you can feed it through the leg or the limb and it's accessible. So the way the kit's set out and the way it's prepared is equally as important as around how you work it and the nomenclature of the kit. Yeah, I was going to ask you some of the um, most important things in the kit. And we've <laughs> mentioned a few times there the tourniquet. Um, for those of the who don't know what a tourniquet is, what it does, what it looks like. Okay, go on, <laughs> just got to describe it. <laughs> okay, um, well, it's, it's basically uh, a, a strap um, which um, effectively is put round a compressible limb um, and um, has and comprises a bar where you turn a, a, a ribbon internally and it just brings in the, 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 the uh, uh, belt, tightens it around the circumference of the limb. So the idea is to bring pressure and compression onto that um, artery internally if, if needs be. And effectively, it's a bit like a, a tap. So you turn in the tap and the, the section that's a tap is called a windlass and it's a bar. So... Um, if, if you look at it, there, there are various sections to it. It's There's a belt buckle. Um, there's a uh, two, st- two sides of the strap. One's Velcro and one's sh- uh, a smooth surface. And then there is a, uh, a bar that goes across and then a little tiny gate which you shove the bar into. And there's a little Velcro cover that locks it across. So in essence, how you apply it um, is generally two inches above the wound site if you can. Uh, it goes on hard and fast. Um, it threads through the belt buckle. You put it tight, put it onto the Velcro, uh, and you put it onto skin if you can. And then once you've got it on, you then start turning this little bar, which then brings in the pressure, which is great uh, for life-saving things, but extremely painful for the casualty. Yeah. So it's always important to actually, if the casualty is conscious and breathing, um, let them know uh, because it's going to hurt them if you're going to put it on properly. Uh, So you turn that on, and then it will turn off the tap. And once you've done that, you just lock it into the gate, close it off, and uh, make sure you uh, take note of the time. I remember... um, And they're orange in colour as well, not black. Everyone goes for Gucci black. I mean, you know, at night when they're covered in claret uh, in a low light and it's raining, you're upside down in a car or in a ditch or in an apartment where there's no light, etc. You just can't see it. So why be Gucci, especially when it's gone loud with with the bullets flying stuff? There's no point. I remember your um, one of your team members, Jake, yep. um, who's been in the military. Yep. He was saying, obviously, you've got to tie it really tight. Mm-hmm. He was saying pe- people who've had it happen to them said it's more painful than the actual gun wound. That's right. That's yeah. how tight you're supposed to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and, and that's a good benchmark if you're doing it right. I mean, obviously, you can visually see it. It's difficult if you've got a, a bleeding profusely from a limb because there's other venal bleed as well. However, if it's squirting under pressure, you, you're more than likely to see it. So... Um, certainly from from knowledge and experience around these uh, application of these techniques, certainly the person that was in the vehicle when those tourniquets, when there was a double tourniquet on, 
Um, it did stop, uh, but there was a lot of blood lost prior to that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, go on hard and fast. fast. Yeah. And what else, what other important things are in the fast aid kit? Uh, well, sea locks. Um, we put sea locks in there. So it's a, um, uh, basically, it's a, a piece of gauze, sterile gauze, which is impregnated with a thing called chitazan. Um, uh, it's a bit crazy, really, because they're seashells that are crushed and pushed into this gauze. Mm. Don't ask me how the scientists came across that. I have no idea. Who tried that first? I, I don't know. Chicken and the egg. So it's a bit <laughs> odd. But it, it is, and it just works. Uh, and it's extremely effective in um, creating a, a clot within a junctional wound and, and very, very effective. Um, developed, I think, in America, used um, over here in the UK for... Um, uh, military purposes, uh, police firearms units, and I think a, a lot of the um, um, uh, specialist care merit teams for ambulances carry it. So that's that's Sealox, and then there's lots of other things, you know, um, chest seals, valved or occlusive ones. Um, um, there's triangular bandages. You know what? They're a great piece of kit for like a couple of quid. Uh, you can do quite a lot with those. Um, um, yeah, so it's quite a good few bits and pieces. Yeah, and if people want to learn more about what's in it, they're just going to have to come on the course. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they can definitely, yeah, and they'll get to to be exposed to that and use it. You know, um, we have a thing called a SAM splint, so it's like a foam splint, but it's aluminium, and you just move it around. It's like when you're a kid at school, you're making all these things with with uh, uh, straws and stuff. You can just mould this stuff, and it's actually really effective in splinting. But it's again understanding how you use that in an environment that we try and replicate through the training course. Yeah. Um, with the tourniquet probably being the most uh, the most important bit of kit in there, would you say? Um, it is, yeah. I mean, the most important kit is the person using it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's knowing when to use a tourniquet and when not to. It's, it's, it's knowing how to use something or when not to use something. Um, and that's as much around you know, having the knowledge of the kit and the application of it, and also about the theory of actually applying it. Um, uh, you know, let's take it for example, example um, someone's fallen from a height, they may have a C-spine injury. So having the knowledge around the different types of uh, interventions on an airway, whether it be a head tilt, chin lift, or a jaw thrust is important because if you've got someone who's got a, a, a fall from height blood trauma, you have a high index suspicion of a a C-spine injury. The last thing you want to be doing is a head tilt chin lift necessarily. So that's not what you're doing. You might consider a jaw thrust. Uh, and to do that, you then think about checking the hard and soft structures of the face. The maxilla is, is the fancy word if you want to get technical. Um, so it's about knowing when to do something, when not to, and then using the right pieces of kit. Um, you know, and, and adapting it as well. So for instance, uh, we have things called oral pharyngeal tubes, which go into the mouth, um, used to clear an airway or to maintain it uh, or assist in it. The, they're called adjuncts. Uh, we use that and adapt it for um, a windlass tourniquet, for instance. So where the bar is for the CAT7 tourniquet I t- talked earlier about, we'd use the OP tube as a, as a, for a tourniquet bar. So you can apply that. Yeah, I was going to ask if there was a, a good substitute for a tourniquet, but I suppose, well, basically it's just Anything a, a stick in a rag. Yeah. <laughs> and a piece of wood is really good. Yeah. And some um, gaffer tape. Um, because the thing is, when 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 you're putting a tourniquet on somebody, um, certainly in the past, uh, one individual we've got we've got videos on the course as well, um, where they they're in so much pain because of the the tourniquet they're trying to remove it, uh, which is interesting because their pain management goes pain thoughts go from the loss of the limb or the the smashed limb to the actual tourniquet and well, that's hurting them more. So it's as much about trying to manage the casualty to stop them from doing that. Yeah. So, I mean, with this course, it is predominantly designed for security professionals. It is, yeah. Um, it, it's designed to, to provide um, very quick aid um, to secure the casualty, assess them in a, a non-permissive environment. Security officers ask are generally assent to uh, an incident, they're a first response. Um, often there's a case they don't know what they're going into. Um, for some reason, if they're wearing uniform, members of the public either like them or they don't. Uh, funny that, because it was a similar sort of thing with the police service. But um, when they get there, it's, it's been able to manage that scene and then the casualty quickly. 
because it could be a uh, uh, an edge weapon attack, for instance. You know, if someone's been stabbed, um, it's a crime scene. So whilst the um, statute emergency services are making their way, they could be the first there. So having that capability around applying uh, first aid and specialist trauma very quickly um, is really important and doing it safely. Yeah. I know a lot of security companies are adopting these kind of courses, especially for Martin's Law, which is um, hopefully coming out this year. Yeah. Um, for anybody who's not familiar with Martin's Law, um, would you mind giving us a quick um, introduction to it? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, Fegan Murray is the person to be speaking to because uh, she championed it um, and created it. Um, through the loss of her, her, her son, um, Martin, from, from the Manchester Arena inquiries, the Manchester Arena attack, sorry. Um, so basically, um, uh, Fegan talks around looking after people, protecting people, and she's a big advocate of, of community resilience. And ultimately, it was about looking at, um, looking at events and, and venues and really bringing those people together and say, look, we've got to look after each other in case these situations happen again. Um, so that legislation moved on at a pace. It went from Martin's Law into the Protect Duty, and now I think it's called the Terrorism Protection Bill, and that's going through legislation now. But in essence, it's around um, um, safeguarding people, um, bringing um, support, guidance, training, and driving standards across the UK within the security sector. Um, uh, and in essence, that's what it's about, really. So with courses like the pre-hospital trauma care course, yeah. what else can security companies be doing to kind of get prepared for this law? Um, just getting um, a, an awareness of, of the, the legislation, how it's going to affect them really, and engaging with um, the agencies that are actually developing that. Uh, there's some great work that's going on uh, at the moment with uh, Nick and, and Fegan around exposure to this type of legislation, and it's, and it's getting very well um, um, publicised uh, and a lot of the security companies are, are on on top of it um, and some of them are ahead of the curve um, there is still a lot of work to do um, and because ultimately there will be a responsibility for these security companies to uh, look after public accessible locations and venues Yeah, I mean it's crazy it's took this long really to get it all going um, well, Yeah yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. who am I to, to comment? But, I mean, you've got 7-7, seven, seven, haven't you? You've got Borough Market, Westminster Bridge, you've got Liverpool Hospital, you've got Manchester, in it, and it goes on and on. And and to think, you know, um, it won't happen again is naive. Um, there's many uh, operations and things that are going on even now as we speak that are looking to interdict and uh, intervene and disrupt, and they're doing some absolutely incredible work. Um, but they only have to be lucky once. Uh, and ultimately... Um, in terms of that, that extreme event, um, that, that will happen one day. But, uh, hopefully it never does, but um, being, being pragmatic is probably likely. So we need to be on top of our game to make sure that we, we put everything in place to look after our people. Yeah, so basically, we're going to have to wait and see, but start preparing now. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there is a lot of preparation going on. You know, uh, there's companies that are doing um, training, medical training, uh, Fret courses, F plus I, um, and they're really sort of like starting to get on top of it. And equally, they're doing um, lockdown plans and um, uh, extraction plans for evacuating buildings and stuff. So um, they're, they're doing some good stuff, and yeah. they can do more. Like you can always do more. I yeah, suppose. of course. Yeah. So, I mean, I suppose we've covered absolutely loads today. Um, <laughs> but to wrap up, um, what would be your one piece of advice you'd give to security professionals? if they are faced in some sort of emergency medical situation? Oh, uh, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Um, you're moving from effectively what is a, um, a fine, complex uh, environment, i.e. everything's just done normally. You can do these skills quite easily, i.e. pick up a pen, use your phone, and you're moving very quickly in a flick of a switch to what is known as a gross motor environment. So things become far more challenging in applying uh, fine complex motor skills. So just keep it simple. Simple things done well save lives. Train, train, train. Uh, Know the makeup and the layout of your kit. Understand how it can be applied when it doesn't need to be applied. Uh, And work as a team. And above all else, look after each other. Love that. 
I love the I love the model. Simple, simple things done. Yeah, was it simple? Simple things done well save lives. Simple Don't things done well. It. You know, you can come out, and I can come out with all the fancy words of you know a ventricular fibrillation and anaphylaxis and all this sort of stuff. You don't need fancy words. Um, if you understand how a person bleeds, uh, to stop it. And they were doing it two and a half thousand years ago. In fact, eight hundred years ago, there was a Dutchman uh, who who came out um, with a quote. Um, and he was, I can't remember his name, Eep, I think it was, anyway, 1261 or something. And he was talking about quartery, ligature, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, uh, the Civil War, 16th century, you're talking about how they developed ligatures and stuff. So it's been around for a long time. The Egyptians were looking after their stonemasons two and a half thousand years ago. When they had stones fall on top of them and break the legs, they knew how to splint them and actually stop bleeding. Um, uh, so keep it simple, simple as that. Um, if someone's bleeding out, just stop it and do as best you can. Um, and ultimately, um, some people, you can't save them all, you know, but you can at least give them a fighting chance. And if you can do that and get them to definitive care quickly, um, you've done as best you can as a non-healthcare professional. Well, Simon, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great fun. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, if you are interested in taking the pre-hospital trauma care course or learning anything more about it, then you can visit the Get Licensed website and the course is on there. But I've also put a link to it in the comments section below. That's all from us. Uh, Please make sure to like, subscribe and leave a comment if you do want any more information on Simon's courses. But we'll see you on the next one.